Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are tuning in from. Welcome to the ninth episode of our free weekly live webinars brought to you by the Football Business Academy in partnership with Socrex. My name is Christian Dobrev. I'm the Chief Partnerships Officer at the FBA, and I will be moderating this webinar. As always, I'd like to begin by thanking everyone who tuned in for last week's fascinating episode in which we looked at workforce transformation in the age of COVID-19 with Rose Reed, Raphael Fish, Alejandra Otero, and Charlotte Hamilton. If you missed it, don't worry, just be sure to check it out later as the recording is available on our YouTube channel or indeed on Apple Podcasts or Spotify if you prefer the audio version. For those of you who are new and hadn't heard of the FBA before, we're a Swiss educational institution entirely dedicated to the football industry. We run a professional master in football business as well as a number of tailor-made football business certificates around the world. Each week of this webinar series, we gather football industry experts who share different perspectives on how COVID-19 is impacting the world of football. Today, we'll look at the important topic of football governance and how the interests of football's main stakeholders are served and protected, both short-term and long-term, as a result of this pandemic. We've gathered some very special guests for this webinar, and it's my great pleasure to introduce them to you today. To start, we have Philippe Mojo, who is the General Secretary at CONCACAF, the governing body for football in North Central America and the Caribbean. Next, we have Alberto Colombo, who is the Deputy General Secretary at European Leagues, the leading representative of professional league football in Europe. Then it's also my pleasure to introduce Amanda van der Voort, Chief Women's Football Officer at FIFPRO, the global representative of professional football players. And last but not least, Stuart Ramalingam, the General Secretary of the Football Association of Malaysia. Welcome to all four of you. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. And um, for the sake of uh, beginning, I will begin with Stuart, simply because of the fact that that's where COVID-19 started, right, Stuart? So, uh, and, and, and Asia um, kind of has more experience in dealing with these types of health crises, right? So. Um, from your perspective, what, if anything, did uh, the Asian football community learn from those previous pandemics, those previous crises, and what have they been able to use from those learning experiences to help shape their response to COVID-19? I think, um, thank you. First and foremost, thank you for having me. I think it's, uh, it's uh, I thought you started with me because I'm on the latest time zone, so uh, and get me out of the way. Uh, but uh, to correct uh, maybe a, a direction and the question is uh, we may not have a lot of experience when it comes to a pandemic like this. It's, a, it's an unheard of uh, uh, incident and an environment that we're all learning from. So it's, uh, n the world has never stopped like this in our lifetime. It's never stopped like this. And for us to, to have to restart and, uh, and adjust our, our business direction. So whilst uh, Asia may have a lot of uh, experience with, uh, with uh, natural disasters or, or, or diseases such as this spreading through certain countries as a, as a region, as, as a continent, as, a, as, a, as, as um, all the continents combined, I don't think uh, we have ever faced uh, an enemy such like this. And um, we've been working very closely in this region. Uh, the, the Asian federations are are fairly close, uh, we're brotherly, uh, and the Asian Confederation has done a tremendous job to, to keep us all aligned and informed and uh, working together to try and find a remedies through football. I think we all, we all see what's happening. Korea was the first to, to get started. I was on the phone with the Korean General Secretary uh, this morning, uh, speaking to him about uh, the do's and don'ts of what they've started there. The direction of their amateur and also uh, youth competitions, which we don't hear about. We hear about the, the top tier uh, league kicking off, but we are also very concerned about the, the base. Uh, so yeah, I mean, Asia, we, we're working together, we're holding hands, we, we're trying to learn from each other and not trying to uh, make the mistakes that the, the leading association in, in our region, Korea is, uh, as we spoke to the general secretary, he was one of those that said, you know, it's such a big risk to be the first to start. And I'm glad that we have a, an Asian partner to learn from and a very open Asian partner that will, is constantly sharing all the information with us. And hopefully that, that experience will help the rest of the world. That's a great story. 
Amanda, obviously football is being played by players and, and I can only imagine that, you know, for them it's been also quite tough. Um, what has FIFPRO FIFA been doing in terms of supporting the, all the players that you represent? I think it's about 65,000 globally, right? So what, what have their main concerns been? Well, uh, first of all, it's great to be here and um, thank you for organizing this and inviting myself and, and of course FIFPRO to to um, be represented on this great panel. It's it's um, great to see all the panelists. And I love the intro, by the way. I feel like we should have some like lights or strobe musics or high five or something as we come down a tunnel with the, the appearances of the pictures. So, um, and uh, and you guys have done a great job on, on these chats. So um, it's great to be here. Um, and yeah, certainly as, as we're looking at the impacts of, of COVID-19 on, on players, FIFA Pro has, absolutely had um, a incredible role over the past several months. Um, just so uh, we're aligned um, kind of as the conversation evolves too, um, good for understanding because you referenced the 65,000 players that we represent for the global union for players. And then we have member associations in each of our country who directly work mostly well, they work directly with the players in, in each of the countries, right? So we're the global umbrella union. So that dictates, of course, a lot of the work that we do. So at FIFPRO, we, um, at the international and global level, of course, we're working with, with stakeholders um, like, uh, like we're actively with FIFA or UEFA or other um, stakeholders um, across the industry to uh, make sure that, that players' needs um, and interests are represented in these conversations. Um, and we offer support, legal advice, support to players, um, uh, and um, we listen. We do a lot of listening. So we've recently launched the Global Players Council, which is a collection of, of players from around the world. And, and we um, convene with them frequently to get insights and, and share insights with them back and forth. So that's been, I think, at the global and international level, very helpful for us. And then we work with each of our member institutions around the world to, to offer them the same guidance and support, but also provide um, research and insights. So it might be research or planning um, prepara preparations for return to play. It could be the report, which hopefully we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about um, later today, like the COVID-19 um, COVID in implications on professional women's football and the Raising Our Game report that we published in um, and last month in April. Um, and, uh, and it could be um, convening our members together to have conversations about what's happening in different countries and different regions. I mean, I personally find one of the hardest things to do and when you're a global institution like this is really get your hands around and for me in women's football, but I think broadly like what is happening every single day in each of these regions and each of these um, confederations and, and each of our members to really understand the impacts that that COVID-19 is is having on our players. So, um, you know, I think an example, a good example is I just had a call the other day with um, some of our uh, members in South America and some of the work they're doing in Colombia, actually, for helping women who, female players, um, they've coordinated a program to help them get um, food food deliveries to women who, who, who may be in trouble, who may have lost their jobs or, or may not be able to play right now. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's troubling out there for a lot of players. And it's critical that, um, that an organization like FIFA Pro or the member unions in each of our countries can, can represent the players and their interests and their needs um, in these conversations. Absolutely. Philip, in, uh, in your region, uh, you deal with 41 member associations, as tiny as Anguilla to as big as the United States Soccer Federation. Um, what, have, what has CONCACAF been doing in terms of supporting them? And, and do you think it might change um, back on the consequences that this pandemic has, uh, has caused? Hi, Christian. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good morning. Good evening to everybody. Thank you for having me in this webinar for also having CONCACAF well represented in this series. Uh, we really appreciate it. A great hello and greetings to uh, our panelists, Alberto, Amanda, and Stuart. Uh, great to be sharing the stage with you in this occasion. And yes, um, as it relates to the crisis and how it's affected our 41 member associations, first, our, our, our thoughts are with 
the affected communities in our region and putting health first is first is the most important thing as it relates to how we address this crisis. And what we have uh, done so far is obviously be in constant communication with our member associations. Stuart mentioned how AFC is looking at it holistically as a, as a region and, and the important communication between the Federation and the Confederation is critical during this time. Uh, but more specifically, what we have done is we have a funding program called the One CONCACAF program that is typically focused on, on use for development of the sport. Uh, what we have done with that program is we've eased restrictions of usage to help alleviate uh, some of the stress and the financial uh, concerns that our member associations are facing. Uh, maybe you utilize it for, for human resources and be able to maintain staff salaries during this time or other uses that, that can help uh, member associations navigate uh, this difficult time. Similarly, we're working with FIFA on a working group that is looking at how to support uh, not only member associations, but all football stakeholders around the world uh, that have been affected. Uh, and obviously that entails a lot of work in terms of really understanding uh, who, how, how the effects have been felt across, uh, where the pain really is being felt and, and ultimately be able to put into motion uh, relief that will help all stakeholders uh, navigate through this difficult time. So, so there's a lot of work uh, being, being being done there at, at the time. And it's gonna be very difficult because uh, being able to navigate this time and not knowing when it's gonna end uh, is part of the challenge, but obviously the communication is, is, is critical and we need to make sure that we really understand the impacts so we can get back to a new normal as quickly as possible. Great, thanks Philippe. Alberto, I guess fairly similar situation uh, with the European leagues. No, I mean you represent uh, 36 leagues across uh, the continent, um, indirectly then also representing 950 clubs. What have um, the support mechanisms been for for the European leagues? And maybe if you want to touch on an example between um, a smaller league and a bigger league. Yeah, hi Christian, hi everybody, and thanks for having the European leagues in this interesting uh, chat and, and conversation. Uh, well, it has been definitely an hectic uh, period for us. I mean, the league has been mainly working on, uh, I would say, three main, uh, three main pillars. Uh, of course, the first one, and I would say that um, this is a process that kicked off uh, already a couple of months ago. You might remember that uh, it was on the 17th of March, if I'm not wrong, there has been this joint resolution of European football uh, that opened a period of definitely of con constructive spirit and cooperation between the stakeholders. I mean, no doubt that the first focus has been on calendar because, and this has been a great work, for instance, uh, uh, together with, uh, with UEFA in finding uh, calendar opportunities uh, during this crisis for uh, the leagues to, to resume and to complete the, the current season. And uh, you all know, because this, of course, has been a worldwide news. Yesterday, we have uh, our first new league, the Bundesliga, to start uh, uh, backing on the pitch behind closed doors with a lot of new uh, restriction and regulation, but it is something definitely uh, 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 very positive for the overall uh, football community, not only in Europe, but uh, uh, a world level. And, and of course, I mean, finding the calendar opportunities, uh, you know better than me, I guess this is an issue that uh, is on top of the agenda of every confederation and every federation is always a big exercise. But we found that definitely a good model that will allow the leagues to resume competition, uh, let's say, as from now till the end of July, beginning of August. And then we know that UEFA will resume its club competition during the month of August. But this has been definitely one important pillar. Second pillar, and I mentioned, of course, of our work during this period has been more on, uh, let's say, financial and regulatory issues. I mean, we have been working through our system organization, that is the World League Forum with, with FIFA, of course, in uh, uh, creating a temporary um, regulatory framework that will allow also the management of the contract of the player, the transfer window, because we know that the season will not terminate uh, this year, that like normally on the 30th of June, but uh, it will last for additional weeks, whether till the end of July or for some clubs even uh, to the, till the end of August. We have been working on other financial aspects also related to cloud licensing, the financial per play with UEFA and the other stakeholders. 
And third, last but not least, has been uh, for sure an incredible work of cooperation between the stakeholders, but mainly between the various leagues in development of new protocols. I mean, this has been one of the key parts, of course, uh, of the work, uh, whether are medical protocols or protocols uh, for resuming training, protocols for resuming uh, uh, competition, uh, new protocols for match operation, they are also related to media, marketing, and broadcasting, and so on. And it's been a huge level of cooperation between the stakeholders, but as Stuart said, uh, 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 as for his experience in the AFC, also an incredible level of information sharing and cooperation um, between our member leagues. I mean, uh, you know that the, most of the discussion are held at the moment uh, at the domestic level between competition organizers and the leagues and the respective governments and health institution. And therefore, there is a lot of uh, uh, experience that uh, our leagues are gaining and that we are uh, more than uh, uh, willing to share internally among our members, but also with the overall football community. Thanks, Alberto. Stuart, um, when, when preparing for this presentation, for this webinar, I, um, I read some news about obviously what's going on in Malaysia and, and something kind of like caught my attention. And uh, it's the topic of player salaries, right? And uh, we already discussed this to some extent in episode three of this uh, webinar series. Uh, but obviously a lot of things have happened since. Um, and usually obviously player salaries is a issue that is discussed between clubs and players with the mediation of an intermediary or a football agent. Um, but at the Football Association of Malaysia, I saw you, you recently introduced a thing called the salary adjustment guidelines. Can you explain why this perhaps was necessary and what the response has been from the affected stakeholders? Uh, thanks. I mean, it's a, it was a very, very uh, touch and go sort of time. Uh, it needed uh, the intervention of the FA in uh, discussions that were ongoing uh, and maybe stagnant in, in some areas. The role of the FA uh, is um, sometimes a thankless role, the thankless role of uh, creating harmony, stability, viability uh, in a, an environment of uh, crisis. Uh, and everybody's kind of elbowing themselves and struggling for their own rights and their own space, uh, which is fine and it's it, in all rights to, to all stakeholders. Nevertheless, as, a, as, as the local FA, we needed to ensure there will be some harmony in the, in the conversation. So we needed to play an active role in getting involved. Uh, we allowed uh, the clubs and players to have their early door conversations. Uh, and, and progress with that. What we found is that we also waited for the FIFA guidelines to come through, the, the guiding principles. And upon receiving the guiding principles, we use the guiding principles as a modus of uh, operations of the salary adjustment plan. Uh, we spoke with the local uh, players union, uh, and we also created a guideline that's middle ground between what is too much and what is too little. Um, we received very positive feedback uh, at that. At, at today, we've not we've not heard anything negative that has come uh, since the announcement of the salary adjustment plan. But as you can uh, understand, that the salary adjustment plan is maybe uh, too little for a club, but too much for a player. So it's always uh, a middle ground perspective that you will have to take. Uh, so you, in a, in a federation role, you don't make friends. Yeah, uh, but you have to make tough decisions. I guess that's the role of the FA. You got to get involved. But I believe uh, uh, there is harmony since the, the guidelines were uh, introduced. It has been adopted uh, by all clubs and accepted uh, very positively uh, from the industry. Uh, but we 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 have a long way to go. Uh, the uh, the salary adjustment plans is in this indefinite uh, suspension of the league, which is also a bit of a domino and a snowball effect that it just keeps adding on and going on. So I believe this, this is a temporary um, a stage where we, we've reached a, a point of uh, equilibrium between the, the wants and the needs of clubs and players. And we hope that you know, as, as our numbers start to drop in Malaysia, we will get football back on the field like some countries have already started, which gives a lot of positive uh, response for us as a federation talking to our local uh, health ministries, our security councils, who are not sports people, so they wouldn't understand. For them, sports is mass gathering, 
uh, body contact sport, uh, perspiration, and you know. So they see sport as a problem rather than as a solution. And seeing the German league kick off, the Korean league kick off, uh, gives a lot of positive feedback to for us to stabilize the industry. Uh, local ministries see uh, sports as a recreation rather than an industry and an economy. And uh, it's also this is the exercise that the federation is taking whilst we have a salary adjustment plan solution between the clubs, leagues and players and officials. We are also working with the federations, eh, sorry, with the ministries in the development of our domestic SOPs if we want to relaunch football again. Yeah. Amanda, speaking of recreation um, in, in women's football, uh, there's also still a long way to go because a lot of the, the leagues and players don't have professional contracts. Um, obviously, yeah, you mentioned uh, in the first question that you, you brought out this uh, Raising Our Game report, right? And, and also a brief on the impact of uh, COVID-19 for women's football. Um, what are the most pressing findings, in your opinion, that governing bodies should be taking into account going forward? Yeah, I'm going to put a pin in that um, because I definitely want to talk about the COVID-19. But as Stuart was talking, I was so... Um, I just was reflecting on that this is a, a conversation about governance and the the I really appreciated Stuart the the real time example of taking the policy from FIFA and implementing it into your own federation and and I think what brought to mind for me was how important it is that that as governing bodies were delivering clear concise and inclusive messaging. Um, because they're all going to be interpreted in the the way of of the the, the country and the context in, in which they're received, right? So, where Stuart's solution might be, um, you know, the the agreement that he reached there, it might look completely different in France. But but it's the responsibility of the global body ultimately to to put a policy forward that impacts everybody. FIFA in this case, right? So, I just thought it was a really um, just a really compelling example, and and it it. It also reminds me of the importance of, of um, the social dialogue and the social com construct when we think about policy um, and, that, and the importance of, of um, I'll quote an article I read in The Guardian yesterday actually that our general secretary sent to me about um, humans are not resources. So coronavirus shows us why we must democratize work. I'm, I've been really thinking a lot and, and Stuart's comments about the, the process really reminded me that health and lives can't be ruled by market forces alone and that we have to include unions and players in, in, these, in these governance conversations. And so, um, you know, transition there, Christian, to what you just asked me about women's football and about the COVID-19 paper that, that we put out in addition to the Raising Our Game report, which you can find both on feedpro.org. Um, under the COVID-19 section, if you just go to the website. Um, what we did is over the past year, year and a half, we um, embarked on some research with KPMG. And our objective was to understand what are the economic forces driving women's fo football and, and what does it look like? Um, what does it look like today? So, so what we found was that the economy was growing, um, the attendance is growing. Uh, you hear FIFA talk about the, the success of the Women's World Cup from a broadcasting and digital online perspective. Um, and we're seeing more big sponsors come into women's football, right, than we've ever seen with Barclays in the UK and Visa doing great programs across Europe, et cetera. And I'm sure people on this call can certainly talk to more of those. Um, and so we were on this amazing trajectory in women's football and then and then coronavirus happened and i'm not i'm i don't know anybody can say it on you know definitively what the future holds for men's or women's football um, but what we decided to do in this moment was hold off on publishing the report because what follows the economics is a recommendation on the player conditions and global um a recommendation for uh, global standards for players so we said, hang on a minute, before we put this recommendation out on what the future should look like with or without coronavirus, let's take a look at what we know based on the data and insights that we've gathered over the past 18 months with interviews with stakeholders and players um, across the board and, and member unions um, and people within the community itself. Um, what does, what could the potential impact 
of coronavirus be to women's football. So that led us to publish the that paper that you just referred, COVID-19, the implications um, to professional women's football. And we raised the alarm bells that that it's these, it's often people on the margins of society, or uh, you know, we see it when we talk about frontline workers all the time, um, or in, in this case, women in football, women's football or or female professional players who who are are significantly impacted um, when economies shift and when resources and, and finances shift, um, sometimes last in is the first to go. And we felt it was important to, to raise this and elevate the dialogue so that when these discussions are being heard or are being had in the boardroom, um, when people are determining financial decisions, or in this case, as we're talking about governance, as people are determining um, you know what are the what are the qualifications to to host an international tournament? Um, what are uh, the the what are the standards to receive funding um, from your confederation or from FIFA itself um, that directly impact the players and keeping women in that conversation? So that's what we launched that report. And then a couple weeks later, we published um, Raising Our Game in its entirety, which is about, I don't know, maybe 100 pages in the end. Um, but, but the key recommendation from Raising Our Game is a, a set of global labor standards, really, um, for uh, women's professional football, and very specifically related to international match conditions. So as we're having um, learning more about what FIFA's plans are for some of their international matches um, and or international scheduling, but also um, new and innovative match um, competition platforms, which I think are great. It's important that we're considering the needs and the standards within those tournaments so that they are um, at the highest level and women's professional football can not only continue where it's come from, but actually we can take it even higher but it's gonna take that collective effort, that collective governance from everyone on, on this call, but the entire football community to make sure um, that we come together and put policies and, and processes and programs in place to achieve that. <laughs> A lot to, um, to take in, but yeah, thanks uh, Amanda for sharing those, those perspectives. Um, Philippe, obviously, yeah. Um, CONCACAF is essentially a competition organizer. Um, and you, you create your own major tournaments as well as having your member associations participating in FIFA's uh, major tournaments. What are you thinking that's going to change? Um, there's also been some talks regarding realigning some of the major competitions, um, you know, with, uh, with the European calendar, let's say. Um, is it feasible? Is it the right time to be looking at this? Is it gonna accelerate uh, because of the pandemic, do you think? Or well, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think what this time has offered us uh, is the perspective that football as a sport uh, is really interconnected, right? As Amanda mentioned, talking about the players and all the stakeholders that have a say into the system, it's incredibly complex. And when you start thinking about everybody having to come together to make these type of decisions, uh, it's incredibly difficult, right? Unlike for example, being here in North America and, and seeing North American leagues consider restarting their competitions, it's okay and it's maybe easier uh, to have some perspective because they're contained into, into this region and, and that's it. Uh, football, however, is intertwined with an international match calendar uh, that affects uh, all the stakeholders in the ecosystem. So being aligned uh, in those conversations and ensuring that we're taking the perspective of everybody is critical. Um, and amongst the priorities uh, at that table, when we think about uh, the international match calendar and the confederation and FIFA uh, being at the table, trying to make a decision, what's, what is the best way to make up matches that have been lost? Uh, first is really considering how our local leagues can restart. That is critical to get the system back up and running seeing the success of, of the Bundesliga this past weekend uh, is incredibly helpful. Uh, and obviously we, we, we hope that uh, the trend can continue across many other uh, countries, but the challenges are significant, uh, right? The protocols that need to be taken into consideration to be able to do so are pretty severe. And, 
and we need to make sure that uh, the, the right decisions are being made at, at the right time with the perspective that we're not the ones making the final decision. The final decision really is uh, dependent on local governments and, and, and public health officials to determine and really provide us the guidance uh, to, make, to make those decisions. So as we think about all that uh, in trying to, to look at an international match calendar, the fact that we've lost uh, mat, uh, dates in March and June, September could be at, at risk if, if, if restrictions continue. Uh, how do we make those up? Uh, every confederation has a match play uh, from a national team perspective that is, that is really important to fulfill during a four-year calendar uh, leading up to, to a FIFA uh, World Cup. And, and making up those dates is really important because it's, it was already scheduled whether it was World Cup qualifying or other continental cup uh, competitions that are scheduled by the confederations. So we're looking at, at how we can make those dates up, uh, allowing and, and creating the roadmap for, for, the, to, for the leagues to be able to, to restart. There's many different ideas on, on, on how to think about that, that calendar. Uh, but obviously the, the perspectives and the challenges really vary across, uh, across the region. And the biggest concern after we're able to see uh, domestic leagues start up is the concept of international play when you have to think about uh, cross-border travel uh, and, and how that's going to work. So we need to be uh, even con considering potential implications as uh, into the future windows if, if we need to be more aggressive on, on how we make up those dates uh, in the future. But at the moment, uh, these dates have been suspended. They haven't been canceled, uh, meaning, meaning uh, March and June. And, and what we want to be able to do is, is, is be able to regain those dates uh, during the next two and a half years um, by working very closely with our member associations, work, working very closely with the leagues and find uh, potential windows that you can open, create in, in the calendar or potentially extending existing windows to be able to regain those match. Nothing's been uh, determined, the, the, the defined at the moment. Those are all considerations at the table. The, the, the uh, conversation will continue uh, to, to evolve. Um, but the, the key at the moment is really understanding all the stakeholders' perspectives and be able to find solutions that, are, that satisfy uh, all the different stakeholders uh, in, this, in this complex ecosystem. Yeah, definitely very complex uh, task at hand. Uh, let's see how, uh, how it will develop. Um, Alberto, also in Europe, um, there's been talks for quite some time now regarding um, yeah, the competition formats, the, the match calendar, etc. cetera. Um, but at the same time, we, we've, I think we've noticed like a, a sense of togetherness amongst European football stakeholders over these past two months. I think maybe they've realized how, 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 the, how more dependent everyone is on each other and how much you know, they're in the same boat and, and trying to obviously find the best um, way forward uh, out of this pandemic. Do you think that this crisis will help uh, and perpetuate that sense of togetherness? Will it help the future meetings, the future negotiations uh, on these topics in which obviously every uh, body usually has obviously their own opinion, their own uh, point of view? I think that we are creating the, the, the premises for this, for this to happen. Uh, as I said at the beginning of this conversation, for sure, we have experienced and announced the spirit of cooperation and, and, and collaboration between, between the various stakeholders. I mean, and building on what Philip said, uh, and I mean, at the end of the day, we, we are really all working in the same ecosystem and we are not only interconnected, we are only interdependent, you know, and uh, uh, at least at confederation level, we work uh, uh, in a pyramidal structure, uh, and uh, and uh, we depend on each other, you know, and 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 therefore we are definitely confident that um, when hopefully uh, we will put you know uh, th this crisis on our back, and and I mean there is no doubt that as soon uh, we will have uh, on top of our table and, and our agenda the issues. Uh, of uh, the format of the competition, of the reform of the calendars, and so on. And uh, we believe that this uh, this period will uh, uh, also help uh, to understand this interconnectivity 
and uh, and the fact that uh, we all need each other and and you know absolutely that we have been very much uh, vocal uh, during the past uh, years in stressing the need of uh, enhancing solidarity and have a greater let's say competitive balance in football because i mean competitive balance is the secret of the game right it's, it's the driver of the passion of the fans and uh, and uh, and we believe that a greater solidarity building on this experience exactly because we all work in the same ecosystem it is something definitely needed now and even more needed in the future why because of course during a financial crisis uh, um, there is definitely the risk of widening the financial gap between those with more resources and those with less resources it is not only about football in every industry when there is a financial crisis the, more, the small fishes are the ones to suffer the most. And, and therefore, there is definitely a risk to widening the gap. And therefore, a growing level of solidarity and a growing level of putting the focus on enhancing a fairness and enhancing a proper balance will be even more needed. It was already essential before this crisis and will become even more important when this crisis is over. Stuart, what, what's your take on this? Obviously, as a federation, you know, you have one eye uh, on the club competitions, on the, on the National League, the other eye on your national team and uh, maybe the, the World Cup pre-qualifiers. -pre um, with the calendar looking to be quite condensed the second part of the year already, like, what do you think, um, how, do you, how can this be managed, like, both in a worst case and a best case scenario? I think uh, Malaysia is a bit of a unique and a bad example to the rest of the world because I, I, I know of, of, of harmonious relationships between federations and leagues and I also know very uh, maybe a tense relationship between uh, federation and league. In Malaysia, uh, since September last year, our FA president is also the president of the league, uh, which allows uh, a one head to manage the, the needs, especially in a, in a crisis. So it's a bit of a blessing that we've reached the point that we have a, a, a dual uh, president, a single president for a dual role, uh, which allowed us to, over the last year plus, uh, to have uh, very positive conversations with the, with the league in terms of management of the domestic calendar. Not knowing this pandemic will face us, I think the the open conversations of match days uh, between us and the league uh, has been uh, discussed. One of the things that although the September dates have not been cancelled by FIFA yet, uh, we have already re returned those dates to the league. So the league could utilize the September FIFA windows uh, to establish the completion of the league. In, in, in Malaysia, unlike in Europe, our calendar is a January to December calendar. So we're just in the start of our season, yeah, uh, and uh, we still got a long way to go. The league has, uh, has uh, rescheduled, yeah, reformatted their competitions to ensure lesser games, uh, and the completion is possible within this calendar year. But um, football is faced by things that are outside of our control today. Uh, the calendar is only a piece of paper until uh, health ministries and uh, national security councils uh, allow you to play. Um, so it takes a, a while before we are able to say uh, what is our priorities. I do not envy you, Philip, in terms of the management of this entire confederation uh, issue. It's hard enough having the concerns of all 41 associations uh, to have different uh, tra uh, travel rules, different immigration policies, different health policies, and, it, and, and to see the possible uh, September, October, November windows, almost impossible to have a uniform confederation being completely open at that uh, windows. So we are eyes wide open from a domestic standpoint. We are working closely with the league because one of the most important things for us this year is to have consistent game time for our players. Uh, with, the, with the fact that we are not sure about the September window, hence us returning those dates to the league. Uh, we've kept the October-November windows for ourselves, but we also have a plan with the league to return those dates to them if uh, the confederation decision 
uh, maybe at a later date will be a, a window that they may be also cancelled. Okay. Amanda, speaking of, of match calendar and, and as such match congestion, um, I know FIFPRO has been also quite vocal in um, getting some statistics, right, in terms of how much players actually do play and travel and, and how little they are uh, allowed to rest, essentially. Um, so last year it was uh, at the limit, um, you know, an analysis that you came up with. And uh, if anything, I think this spotlight, uh, this pandemic has put a spotlight on, on, on that issue, right? That, you know, players are sometimes being seen as resources and, you know, the more competition is the better, but in, a, in, a, in essence, you know, it actually might, might backfire. Um, what is FIFPRO's position and, and maybe recommendation for finding that right balance? Because everybody obviously understands that there, there needs to be um, enough competitions to, to, go, um, to go around and to have the whole pyramid functioning. But where's that limit? Where's that balance? Yeah, I think it's um, you know, both Alberto and, and Philippe were talking about uh, stakeholders coming together about the spirit of collaboration. Um, and Stuart gave some really good examples of how that's that's working um, for him and, and between his league and his um, federation. And I think that this time has probably um, elevated the role of collective negotiations, the role of unions, probably more than um, we've seen in, in history, because make no mistake about the fact that players are stakeholders in this game and they need to be in those conversations about what the future of their workplace looks like. So um, yeah, what you referenced was our 2017 report called At the Limit. Um, again, any viewers can get it at fiefpro.org. Um, it should be under the health section on the website um, or you can just search it and get it pretty easily. Um, but we, yeah, we detailed um, you know, the, the impact on, on players related to the conditions that, that they're um, you know, they compete within, whether that's travel, whether that's games, um, you know, amount of time between matches, um, or distance traveled, or the impact between national and club competitions and how players are, are um, managing their time and, and, and workload, player load. Um, so um, as we forward ahead to, to today, certainly, um, those those issues are, are highlighted and as we're starting to look at match calendars and coming back to play um, we'll see uh, maybe condensed match condensed timelines less rest and recovery between um, between games and so of course we support the the the, the match um, the substitution rule that, that FIFA put in place so that you can have five substitutions um, at three different intervals within the match um, which helps regarding um, loads so players can get enough rest. Um, but we have some really specific recommendations in the report for the amount of time between between matches and and travel that um, you know that, that players should be subject to. So I think that it's important that that those are represented in in those conversations e equally as much when we start talking about coming back to play. And I referenced it earlier um, the on the women's side, some new competitions that the FIFA president referred to after at the end of the Women's World Cup, I think it was right before the final, you know, we talked about the potential for a FIFA Club World Cup, um, uh, FIFA Women's World League, these kind of international tournaments. And I think within any of that, we have to make sure we're talking about the standards and conditions by which the women are playing. Because the more we can elevate the standard of play, and the more we can elevate, create opportunities for players to compete at the most elite level. So they're not sleeping on buses, trying to get from one match to another. They're not, um, you know, staying in a hotel with, you know, numerous other teams. Um, it, it, there's certainly a list of conditions and, and standards, which I would recommend anyone who wants to, to have a look at them to check out the Raising Our Game report. Um, but those all have to be part of, in addition to, to the insights and research that, that we uncovered in the At Our Limit report, um, those all need to be considerations when we do put forward um, new calendars, new schedules, and, and for sure, new competitions. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I see one of our viewers, um, Ita Ingber, mentioned that um, the example of Bundesliga, there's already eight injuries um, amongst the different teams there. 
And uh, next team, next week, apparently each team will play three matches. So yeah, his question was, is it fair to put players to that? And is there any other solution apart from the five substitutions? So I guess this is untested um, waters for, for everybody. So hopefully as the, the days uh, go on, the, the governing bodies, um, such as the leagues and et cetera, will be able to identify measures that can hopefully um, you know, protect the health of, uh, of the players. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and track and measure. And I would say um, the same how we've, we've got this data about the Bundesliga as the Frauen Bundesliga returns or other women's leagues around the world come back into action. We need to track and measure these instances and this data. One of the things we found in the Raising Our Game report and doing that research is that women's football is not measured. Like it was really hard to get information about the women's game, frankly, because it doesn't exist. And so I think we can take that as a learning and as we go forward, as we resume, resume play, just like we're tracking that kind of data and, and insights on the men's side, which I think is invaluable and incredibly important that we're doing so, I think the women um, deserve the same. Yeah, thanks. Philippe, back to you. Um, FIFA, uh, sorry, CONCACAF <laughs> had uh, its own crisis uh, about five years ago with the previous administration. Um, and then obviously you guys came in and, and kind of like took a blank slate approach to uh, developing the new CONCACAF. Um, what can you tell us in terms of what you've achieved over those past years and if anything has this pandemic caused you any um, rethinking in terms of whether you should focus your efforts on, on particular topics which maybe weren't so much on the table um, you know is there is there that need is it a good uh, time to, to change strategic course thanks Christian uh, yeah Look, before prior, prior to 2016, it is uh, well documented the challenges that CONCACAF faced as part of the activities of, of previous administrations. Under the leadership of our president, Victor Montagliani, who was elected in, in May 2016, the, the focus of the Confederation really turned to corporate governance, to putting a football first mentality and, and really creating a, a unifying uh, structure of our with, through our member associations, really creating what, what we call uh, one CONCACAF. So since then, there's been strong reforms being put in place, uh, meaning our statutes have been updated to really uh, help the Confederation be better governed, uh, mirroring the, the reforms that were, put, were, were taking place at, at the FIFA level. We also put in place a, a new administration. We restructured the way we go, we do, we go about our, our operations. And doing that entailed bringing uh, strong talent from from other industries and 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 uh, from other sports in order to really bring best practices to the organization. For example, our, our CFO uh, had a long career in the consumer goods industry, having worked at Unilever and at Avon. Our chief legal officer came uh, from Yahoo, having had a long career uh, in Latin America with with other internet companies as well. And you had uh, Heidi Pellerano, our chief commercial officer, who has uh, had a great success at Wasserman for a long time, uh, coming to really uh, run in, and lead our commercial operation. So bringing strong talent like that to help govern our, our, our organization. And within all that, putting football first has really been uh, the key focus uh, of, of Victor and this administration. And what we have been able to achieve over the past four years really is uh, focus on increasing competitions, increasing access uh, to the sport, uh, whether it's through our Nations League, for example, which we're able to develop, uh, focusing on a better national team competition for all our member associations. Uh, we're able to play uh, already the group stages of our first edition of Nations League, where we played 102 matches across the Confederation. And that's a significant achievement uh, for this for this confederation, really giving the opportunity for more to compete on an ongoing basis. Similarly, we also expanded our Gold Cup uh, in 2019 from 12 to 16 teams, giving more access to our member associations to compete at the highest levels. Uh, and we had a fantastic tournament uh, in, in 2019. We've also had a uh, very important focus on women's football. We launched a women's football strategy in the back of the Women's World Cup in France and have looked at increasing the competitions as Amanda was referencing to be able to give more access to, uh, to women and young girls in our, in our region, uh, the opportunity to play. 
2020 is a very important uh, year for us in women's competitions. And unfortunately, we've had to suspend some of those, but we'll certainly be looking at making up the, those competitions uh, in the future and, and creating more access through uh, some of our development activities, such as our next play, which are specifically focused on, on, on young girls. So we feel we've made tremendous, tremendous progress over the past four years. And when Victor was reelected uh, in March of, of last year uh, out of Congress, he said one thing and, and it really resonated with all of us. And he said, we have earned the right to think long-term. Uh, we had earned that right through all the work done over the past uh, three and a half years. And we were able to now collectively as a confederation and along with our member associations to think about our future, our long-term future, and, and really the development of, of our sport, having gone through a lot of that turmoil and having put the right pieces in place uh, in, to, in order to do so. Unfortunately, I think this, this pandemic uh, has affected that because it has made us focus back on, on short-term, right? We've had to suspend a lot of competitions We've had to, we have to do some major surgery to some uh, formats and calendars uh, in, in our confederation that require all hands on deck. Uh, and that is from here until 22. So uh, I'm not gonna say unfortunately, but the focus really is uh, on trying to make sure that we are able to uh, restart our competitions in the best way possible and the safest way uh, possible. That will uh, be, a, a, an ongoing uh, focus and process for the next few months and, and, and certainly until we'll, we get back to, to a new normal. Uh, and that uh, is taking away a little bit of the, the longer term thinking, but uh, we do feel we're in a good place to capitalize on the foundations and platforms that CONCACAF has instilled. And, and we really uh, feel very strongly about our potential to continue to grow as a confederation and, and, and to generally grow the sport in a region uh, for the long term. So we, we feel very optimistic about our future, independent of the situation we're living today. That's great. Thanks, Philippe. Uh, Alberto, you mentioned the term competitive balance before. And um, another term that I know that you and the other European football stakeholders um, have mentioned on a number of occasions since this pandemic started is integrity, right? The integrity of the, of the competitions. And um, obviously with each country league, essentially having to take uh, different decisions, whether it's by themselves or by their uh, local government uh, guidelines, uh, we've seen that yeah, some, some leagues are started again, such as the Bundesliga, others have already been canceled for the season, such as the one in France, Belgium, and, and the Netherlands. Um, do your member leagues feel that the integrity of the European uh, club competitions or the UEFA competitions might be at risk because of this different scenarios uh, that we see across the continent? Yeah, but first, uh, most of our leagues, I would say the, 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 the totality of our leagues uh, uh, are working to resume their competition. And uh, one of the main reasons to resume the competition, even of course, to protect the integrity of the competition itself. You know, if uh, if you are able to play all the matches and to have a final table uh, with all the clubs having played all the match of the season, that's the, by far the best way to respect the integrity uh, uh, of the season with a, with a winner, with clubs that are promoted, with clubs that are relegated within the pyramid. Having said that, this is the priority for most, uh, for most of the leagues. We can, of course, not blame those leagues that uh, have not been able to finish their competition because, as we said earlier during this conversation, it's not up to competition organizers to take this decision, but this decision has been taken by, by the respective governments, right? I mean, the decision in the Netherlands to finish the competition, the decision in France, the decision in Belgium not to allow football to be played till the 31st of July, it basically uh, uh, oblige the league to consider their their uh, their season uh, uh, over um, and and hopefully uh, building on the success of this past uh, past weekend uh, on the on the stadium of uh, of uh, of German football uh, we will have uh, in the upcoming weeks and days uh, other leagues to 
to resume, you know, just to give you some dates. I mean, the Czech Republic uh, was back playing on the 25th of May, of May, followed by Denmark, 28th of May, followed by Poland, Israel, Serbia, Lithuania. I mean, it's important also that we are talking about medium and small leagues. And, uh, you know, always the public opinion is dominated by, by the top leagues. Fantastic to have the Bundesliga back, but it's also good to, to stress that all these countries all over Europe, they are making a huge effort uh, to resume the respect of competition and yes, to also respect the integrity uh, of the game as a, as, a, as a key pillar. And if the season will be over by playing all the matches, this will be important. In, in case there will be, and we, we also know, I mean, the fresh news has been that today the Scottish club decided to consider the season uh, concluded in the Premiership and uh, they have been applying, let's say, the principle and value of sporting merit to conclude their season. And this is something that it was also linked to the guidelines that has been issued by UEFA back, uh, back two, two weeks ago, in case uh, leagues uh, or federation are able to conclude uh, the, their respective competition. Uh, uh, it is important to have a set of guidelines to define also those clubs that are qualifying for international club competition. That is, of course, UEFA club competition in case of Europe, but the same uh, other continental uh, club competition uh, Philip might have in CONCACAF or other uh, clubs might have in the respective confederation. So we believe that uh, 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 giving priority to sporting merit is uh, something uh, fundamental. And also we are very much happy that uh, uh, the decisions that are taken at domestic level uh, by the domestic competition organizer, in this case, the leagues, uh, in cooperation with uh, the respective federation, are then um, fully accepted by the respective confederation at continental level. And this is, the, uh, as said, fundamental because we, we work in a pyramidal structure and the interconnectivity uh, uh, asks us to perform in this way. Thanks, Alberto. Stuart, um, from a governance point of view, um, there's another element that obviously generates that concept of, of integrity within the league, um, and it's the club licensing system, right? And um, it's been helping obviously instill better management practices in, in football for a number of years now, um, because clubs need to adhere to strict criteria, you know, in order to get the license and be able to, to compete. Um, with so many clubs suffering right now, and especially economically, do you foresee that these club licensing criteria will be relaxed for next season or do you think that they will that, that the whole system of club licensing will need to change in the immediate future or maybe even long term um first and foremost uh, just to, to explain a bit of the landscape in malaysia we are one of the last countries to convert fa to fc so we we're, we're made up of a lot of football associations that are converting themselves to an fc at the moment and the deadlines that we had in mind uh, was uh, till September 2020 for all teams to be considered FCs as we moved into the new season in 2021. Obviously, everything is up in the air. Uh, and with, uh, with these uh, uh, recent uh, situation that we are all facing, I think uh, a lot. Of, we like to use the term the new norm, I suppose. I hope a lot of it is the temporary norm. Uh, because uh, club licensing uh, needs to also find a temporary reality. Uh, there is an understanding and a practical sense that needs to fall into the guidelines for this year as we move into football. Because as, you, as we say, we can, we can play arrogant and we can play silly by, by keeping the, the level of club licensing to where it is. But uh, that also throws the employment of thousands of people on the line uh, for mere fact of a lot of things that are out of control of the clubs this year. So we'll have to use some practical sense uh, to readjust where club licensing sits. But nevertheless, I believe the club licensing regulations, the direction of the implementation of club licensing should not. Uh, we've been building on the infant uh, phases of club licensing in Malaysia. We've, we've tried to improve and, uh, and scale up club licensing year on year. I believe uh, the licensing process for 2021 will need to be readjusted in a more practical sense, but we will need to get back to, uh, to, to where we were uh, to ensure that the professionalism in the domestic market is not 
thrown out of whack just mere because of one pandemic that's here with us today might not be the, with us next year. So one of the things that we uh, we've, we're trying to push internally is is for for mass to understand and and for us within the football community to understand that uh, this crisis is something that money can can't pay for experience. Uh, we all learn, we readjust our direction, we readjust how we see a lot of things, but we should come out of this wiser and stronger and a, a lot safer in terms of where our business propositions will sit as a, as a football organizer. Uh, so here, I believe the, the experience should not change the professional direction, uh, but nevertheless, uh, put some practical sense into club licensing for the end of this year for next year. Okay. Uh, Albert, Alberto, what's your take on this? Because obviously, the current model of football has been uh, exposed to be quite vulnerable. Um, you know, a lot of clubs and leagues don't necessarily have big cash reserves as let's say traditional companies uh, sometimes are required to do. Do you think that um, this crisis will serve as some kind of a wake up call to, 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 to the clubs, let's say, uh, especially, but also to other stakeholders um, leading up potentially to even stricter financial fair play regulations to more sustainability, prudent management, et cetera? We, and when I say we, of course, I'm talking on behalf of our member leagues. I mean, the leagues believe is in club licensing. I mean, there is the, uh, no doubt that uh, uh, football is uh, is uh, right now uh, in a in a better financial situation if compared with uh, back ten ten years ago. You know, so that definitely financial fair play uh, when it comes to let's say uh, European Confederation level, but also those. Uh, a club uh, licensing model that has been implemented at the domestic level that often they go even beyond the financial fair play uh, uh, at the European and UEFA level has been definitely helped to create a more sustainable, uh, a sustainable business. As I said before, we have to be careful that uh, this uh, uh, period uh, will not uh, uh, allow uh, clubs to, let's say, widening the gap. Uh, we have actually do the opposite. So financial fair play is definitely, and whatever kind of club licensing, you know, we don't need, need uh, uh, to speak mandatory about financial fair play, but club licensing in, is a way to control uh, cost and to have a proper uh, financial sustainable model. So that, uh, uh, of course, in a, pre in a period of crisis, it is even more important to have a, a control uh, a structure of the finances. This, this is something valid for all, all the stakeholders so that uh, we have actually to use uh, uh, this period to, uh, uh, to have a proper implementation of club licensing. And, uh, and, uh, and we believe that actually it's even more important to, uh, than ever to have a full implementation of these mechanisms because alleviating this kind of uh, uh, control on, on, on cost and the use of finance will actually uh, put football back uh, uh, to the situation of some, some years ago. So actually, we believe in more licensing than in less, rather than in less final licensing. And this is crisis, is an opportunity to reiterate that. Thank you, Alberto. Amanda, um, it almost seemed like years ago, but the last event that you and I participated in was uh, at the beginning of March in Amsterdam, um, where FIFPRO hosted the Women in Football. European expansion event. Um, and during that event, you know, there were lots of stakeholders, including FIFA, UEFA, BCA, European leagues, uh, and many other brands, clubs, you name it. Um, and they all, you know, kind of like discussed uh, the need of, uh, you know, more female leadership in football, you know, and the benefits that it could bring. How do you think football stakeholders can actually accomplish this? Because I think, you know, one of the things that that event showed is that, you know, some people don't necessarily know which structure or pathways they need to, to, to implement in order to make it work. So what's your, what's your perspective on this? Well, I, uh, I definitely uh, recall that event as such an inspirational opportunity for us to have this conversation with so many people in the game, men and women um, who joined Women in Football. Uh, we hosted the event at Thief Pro House in, in Amsterdam. Um, broke out into working groups, had a, a you know, a, a final kind of <clears throat> um, recommendation really on, on, on how to 
bring women in football and their organization um, to greater Europe. Um, the, right now they're in, in the UK and, uh, and they're one of their um, initiatives and one of the things which you're just raising Christian here is, is women, women in leadership positions, women in the boardroom. Um, and I think at this time, it, it it's, um, couldn't be more critical uh, that we think about that. But you, you touched on a, a important word, which is how, because I think a lot of times we say what, like we need women in the boardroom, but we don't really talk about how to do it. And, uh, and I love, um, I love Philippe, you quoted Victor, that we've earned the right to think long-term. And I, I, I'm, I'm compelled by that by that comment and it um, it actually reminded me of a, an op-ed that I recently read in the Washington Post by the King of Jordan who said, we all have optimism that we'll rebuild, but rebuilding is not enough. We should focus on creating something uh, new and something better. And I think we've all tipped our hats to that a little bit throughout this conversation, right? About the need for something um, different, something uh, uh, innovative, um, how do we come back from this crisis? And we've talked about the new normal for, for a, a, a little bit, but I think the question really becomes, how do we, how do we create a new vision? And then, and then us as leaders, how do we then take football there? And, and women in the boardroom is a key component of that, not just for women's football, but all of football. So um, I'll actually reference um, in 2016, for those of you who are familiar with our politics in the United States, after uh, that presidential election, um, a friend of mine was working for a company called the White House Project uh, in Washington DC. And, and today there's, uh, she works for a group called Vote Run Lead. And what they are is organizations dedicated to getting women into politics, into leadership positions in politics. So. Um, working through a very systematic approach to identifying women who would be interested in, in running, um, having a conversation with them that they can run as they are now, that they're qualified and they're experienced. And if they have an interest in running for a leadership position or um, engaging in these, these levels of conversation in football, they're, they're qualified and they stepping forward is, um, they're welcome to step forward. Like we want them in the industry. Um, and then lastly, training, training them how to build a campaign, how to, how to, um, yeah, how to get votes, <laughs> how to uh, uh, elevate their position um, internally. So it's very systematic, but I think in football, we have to look to other models and other areas, other governance models, other, um, maybe there's countries who've done an excellent job of, of balancing the boardroom or finding equality. Um, and so if we can take examples like this and implement them within the football systems and structures, I think we're all going to be really um, uh, that much more ahead of the game. When I was the president of the United Soccer Coaches in 2016 in America, it's a 30,000 member nonprofit association dedicated to, to coaches. Um, when I first started on the board in 2010, uh, I by the time I became president um, six years seven years later, I was the fifth female president in 75 years. During that period of time, myself and the board worked to implement a leadership structure and advocacy um, structure underneath us for, uh, for different minority groups or um, coaches who weren't otherwise represented. And we worked with them to teach them the skills of, of being in a boardroom, give them the opportunity to advocate on behalf of the things that matter to them. And what we've seen actually over a period of time now that I'm no longer president is there's actually four more women immediately after me um, in line, either have been president um, with a woman called Leslie Gallimore from Washington or are in line to be president now to come. And that structure and that system didn't just happen. It was intentional and it was a board of directors who got together and said, we need diversity in our leadership team. And I think the important thing to note is when I first started in 2010, we were on, I mean, we, we had no money. We were maybe $500 in the bank. I mean, it was, it was not a, a great financial situation for us. And by the time my presidency was over, we had two and a half million um, in, uh, in cash and a uh, foundation, we had launched a foundation which just topped over a million in the foundation. So, um, but that wasn't, that, again, not by mistake. The financial success of that organization was driven by the inclusion and the diversity of its leadership. 
thanks Amanda for, for sharing that uh, that perspective and hope uh, hopefully other bodies that want to implement this type of change uh, now have a slightly better idea of how they can uh, go about it or they can contact you to, uh, to get some more insights. Um, I see we're running quite over time already. So Philip, uh, I would like to finish off with you. What's, what's the future outlook? What, uh, what are the key lessons and, and opportunities, the main opportunities that governing bodies such as CONCACAF can take um, forward and, and consider uh, for the future? Well, Christian, I think one of the things we, we've learned and, and it's cl clearly evident uh, through this panel, uh, the diversity being shown, we have the perspective of a federation, of the players, of the leagues, of a confederation, uh, so really how intertwined our, our world of football is. Uh, and therefore, the really important need to collaborate and take different perspectives in decision making uh, is critical. And, and I think that's a great takeaway for all, to be, for all of us to be much more uh, focused on, on that and, and, and understanding that we need to make sure that uh, everyone's views are heard. Uh, having more diversity clearly will help uh, get to better decisions uh, in, in the end. Uh, and I think more concretely, uh, things that we've learned at CONCACAF that, that, that were taken away from, from a time like this is maybe there's ways to, to, to be more effective uh, on how we go about our own efforts uh, in trying to deliver behind our mission of developing the sport. Specifically, this time, uh, while we had to suspend a lot of our development efforts, uh, we have actually taken those uh, uh, on, onto digital platforms and have found great success in terms of the reach uh, and the scale of the, of the initiatives we, we put in place. Uh, we have an e-learning platform for our technical directors and coaches across a region. Our development team has launched and is leading and it's getting great traction. And that's a new norm for us. Uh, that uh, clearly helps uh, one of the major uh, issues we have in our confederation, which is travel and getting our members together. It's incredibly difficult. So here we, we, we have developed a best practice that is here to stay and, and that we're gonna be embracing. We have done so similarly uh, in refereeing development. Uh, we have now an online portal where we're instructing referees across the region, working with our member associations in that development. Uh, and that's also uh, getting great, great, great traction. So those, uh, those learnings from, from, from this time are opportunities that we're taking with us into the long term. Uh, and then the, the, the need to collaborate and ensure that uh, we are hearing what all our stakeholders need and try to satisfy those needs uh, through solutions to the, into the long term is something that we're working towards. Uh, there's going to be a lot of pain felt uh, across the system, and and we need to make sure that that we try to work uh, in a way that uh, we find best outcomes for everybody, which is certainly a challenge. Absolutely, a challenge, uh, but with every challenge comes uh, comes an opportunity. Um, anyway, with this, um, I would like to conclude uh, this uh, very international webinar, I think the most international we've had so far, um, all the way from Miami to uh, Kuala Lumpur. Thank you, Philippe Modra from CONCACAF, Alberto Colombo from the European Leagues, Amanda van der Voort from FIFPRO, and Stuart Ramalingam from the Malaysian FA. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in and watching. Um, if you did join later uh, or want to share this great webinar with some friends, colleagues, um, feel free to share it uh, as it will be available on our YouTube channel after this is finished. Um, likewise, stay tuned uh, towards the end of the week as we announce the next topic and speaker for the 10th episode of uh, this FPA series. And in the meantime, wishing you all the best. Stay safe and take care of yourselves. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.